Welcome everybody to our uh, Tuesday lecture at the Kellogg Institute. Um, it's wonderful to see so many people joining. More are joining um, as we speak. I see the numbers are going up quite rapidly here um, and quite a few had registered. So I'm sure the, the, uh, uh, the audience will swell a little bit as we begin. Um, but we can get started without uh, a, a great introduction because uh, we're here together with our friend and well-known colleague Clemens Sudmack today, um, who's talking about uh, the new Integral Human Development Policy and Practice Lab that the Kellogg Institute, uh, under his leadership and direction, has uh, created as of um, last year. And this is the first public event in relationship with the lab, so Clemens uh, will be introducing us to integral human development, a concept, a process, and a lab. Afterwards, we'll have time for questions. Um, as Teresa mentioned in her opening uh, comments about the process here, you can ask questions either by raising your virtual little hand through the reactions button down below, and I'll try to keep an eye on that queue. Um, but if you prefer, for whatever reason, just to type your questions into the chat, I'll try to keep an eye on that at uh, the end and, and can pose them for you. So if you don't have a good connection or whatever else, uh, feel free to do that. So without any further ado, uh, Clemens, uh, welcome and thank you for being here and, uh, uh, and guiding us here today in this discussion about integral human development. Thank you so much, Paolo. Thank you so much for joining us here this afternoon. I just survived the Notre Dame alert while you were speaking. You know, my telephone was <laughs> blurting out, this is an alert. So it's, it's good to be back on mute. Um, I will talk for about 30, 35 minutes, I was told. And I will spend uh, most of my talk on the concept of integral human development, because this is what we did mostly for the past year, uh, pandemic. Um, um, caused by the pandemic. We, we couldn't do much, uh, you know, real field work. I have an opening remark. Then I would like to talk uh, firstly about the language game and the semantic dilemma. Secondly, about learning from my colleagues. Thirdly, questions and concepts. Fourthly, incompatibilities. And finally, dignity practices. And then a very brief uh, concluding remark. So language game, learning from my colleagues, questions and concepts, incompatibilities, and dignity practices. My opening remark is an opening image. In the first book of Samuel in the Old Testament, Hebrew Bible, we find the colorful description of a thought-provoking scene. The young shepherd David is willing to fight Goliath, or Goliath, you say in English, Goliath. King Saul shows generosity and clothes David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped Saul's sword over the armor and he tried in vain to walk for he was not used to them. David admits, I cannot walk with these uh, for I'm not used to them. David cannot move. He's too small for the armor. Probably the most precious and maybe the heaviest armor of the time. The, the image is quite powerful if we translate it into our present situation, into the situation we find ourselves in. We have built huge armors of technological possibilities and agency, but we have not grown in the same way morally or spiritually. In other words, we are like moral and spiritual dwarfs in the armor of giants. It is significant that we still study Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics in order to have a better understanding of the world. Aristotle's contributions to science have lost much of their relevance and plausibility, while we have not made enough progress on the grounds of morality to render his moral observations obsolete. There seems to be a disconnect between technological and moral progress, between economic growth and spiritual growth. We have, as Pope Francis and Sigil Laudato Si states, not been trained to use power well. We have too many means and only a few substantial ends. We have too many means and only a few substantial ends. That's Laudato C. 203. Integral human development, as I would like to understand it, is, committing, uh, is committed to bridging this gap between means and ends, between external progress and inner growth. It is committed to integrating our technological possibilities into our moral and spiritual identity. 
a few words about the language game that I want to play here. The language game I want to play this afternoon, uh, I would like to call a non-authoritarian and source-sensitive approach to IHD. A non-authoritarian and source-sensitive approach to IHD. Let me start with the idea of source-sensitive. Integrated human development, the concept, is rooted in a tradition. This is a tradition not only of thought and concepts, but also a tradition of practices. In, in 368, for instance, um, Peter Brown identified what he called um, a revolution in the moral imagination when there was a famine in Cappadocia and Basil of Cappadocia made it clear to his um, people that uh, the starving people were of their concern. These were their brothers and sisters. That's part of the Christian social tradition, which um, is at the background of integral human development. So it's rooted in a tradition, both in thought and also in practice. It's not the child of academic research. It's not the product of a scholar who wants to make a name for himself or herself. And there's nothing wrong, I guess, with trying to make a name for yourself. But this is not what IHD is about. There is not a claim to this being original, this being innovative, this inhabiting a niche in the academic discourse. It's not even primarily a child of modernization, even though we could say that um, Catholic social teaching with the documents started uh, in the wake of modernization in the late 19th century and integral human development as a concept emerged in this Catholic social teaching tradition. Um, it was also not designed uh, to be a defining motto of a, a policy school. And I say that not because I think it's not a good idea to have the Keogh School embrace integral human development, but this is not the work the concept normally does. It is not an advertising tool and is not um, a concept that's designed uh, to make people commit to a, a particular type of policy making. The argument that it doesn't work in practice is from the source context limited. And that's actually a kind of dramatic thought. Many people like to say integral human development doesn't work. It's, it's too unrealistic. It's too, too far away from reality. And if you, if you look at the source, uh, the argument that it doesn't work in practice is not even terribly strong. I remind all, all of us of the Sermon uh, on the Mount discussion. Many people saying the Sermon on the Mount, which one could say is um, Christian ethos um, and spirituality in a nutshell. Many people said it doesn't work in practice, well, but it's still there. It's still uh, this imperative by which Christians uh, are encouraged to live. And... Um, you, you all remember the parable of the lost sheep. And the parable of the lost sheep also seems not to work in practice. Um, the parable of the lost sheep is, uh, as you know, the shepherd leaving the 99, uh, running after the one that has gone astray. And this is not the logic we follow. And so um, IHD is uh, part of a tradition that is not uh, designed to be as realistic as possible even though, of course, we believe that it makes um, a lot of uh, difference here on this earth trying to follow uh, the Christian social tradition. So this is what I mean by being source sensitive, having an understanding of this is where the concept comes from. This is where its roots are. This is where it is embedded. Um, and um, this is where I may have to respect. It's much more than a concept. It's embedded in a tradition with practices as well. So this is what I mean by the source sensitive approach uh, to, to IHD. The non-authoritarian uh, means that I cannot speak on behalf of IHD. Um, no one can claim to be the sole owner of the discourse, even though integral human development has become institutionalized in the Roman Curia as a dicastery. So I will not say IHD teaches us, but rather in my understanding of IHD or maybe from a Catholic social teaching perspective, IHD implies. This is what I mean by non-authoritarian. Who am I to speak with authority on IHD? In this talk, I will focus on my understanding on IHD based on some familiarity with Catholic social tradition. So that's the language game I, I want to play. Being source sensitive, which seems to be a matter of prudence, semantic transparency, and intellectual integrity. 
at the same time, non-authoritarian, inviting, obviously, critical voices and helping us to refine the concept as it emerges. Obviously, there is a semantic dilemma when we try to clarify what integral human development means. The dilemma is this. Should it be inclusive or informative? Inclusive or informative? And this goes back to the well-known um, distinction between intention of a term and extension of a term. The intention indicates the internal content of a term or concept, and the extension indicates its range of applicability. And um, the dilemma is this. The more precise you define the intention, the smaller the extension will be, and vice versa. Which brings us to the point of, do you want to have a clear identity of IHD, which comes at the price of exclusion? Or would you like to be inclusive, which comes at the price of vagueness? What I would try to suggest is, I would try to um, contribute some aspects of precision by offering a few necessary conditions. I looked at some of the questions that have been fed into our document prior to this event. And one question dealt with this uh, concern, are there necessary conditions for IHD? So that's my first point, the language game. Um, a source uh, sensitive but non-authoritarian approach to IHD. And um, I will try to offer some necessary conditions without um, claiming that I can be too precise. Learning from my colleagues. There is so much we can learn from our colleagues. And um, one of the learning tools that the Kio School um, has developed, and uh, I thought, by the way, that this was part of my work here in the IHD Research Lab, is the Dignity and Development blog. For those of you who do not know that, the Kio School has uh, a blog with approximately one uh, post per week dedicated to all kinds of topics as long as they are related to integral human development. So that's the, the, the only restriction that we have. You can write about everything and anything as long as there is a connection to integral human development. And we have about 56 blogs so far, starting on April 22nd last year. Um, and I reread uh, most of the blogs in preparation for this talk. And there is so much to learn from my colleagues' understanding of IHD. And I drew five lessons uh, using this bottom-up approach. What do my colleagues think about IHD expressing themselves in their blog posts? Five lessons. Number one, the central role of human dignity. The central role of human dignity. The intrinsic dignity of each person on the basis of her being human is uh, a recurrent theme in many of those blogs, the central role of human dignity. And if we accept that, we have a fundamental equality of all on that basis. Uh, a fundamental equality of all on that basis prior to any social or political um, distinctions or inequalities. Secondly, a relational understanding of development and the human person. A relational understanding of development and the human person. Words like encounter, presence, accompaniment ring through many of those blog posts. And there is this idea that the human person is um, by... Um, her very nature a social animal. It's so on politicon and that we live in relationships and through relationships and that community is not optional but necessary. We depend on communities, which also limits a certain understanding of autonomy. It, it uh, would translate into a sense of relational autonomy. Um, it would lend itself to a distinction between the person as the relational being uh, versus the individual as the isolated being. So development would be understood of um, an undertaking of persons, but not an undertaking of isolated individuals. That's the second lesson, a relational understanding of development and the human person. The third is the consideration of cultural richness, the role of beauty, and the role of the imagination. We have um, theologians, philosophers, um, uh, humanities-based experts, um, anthropologists contributing to the blog, and uh, many blogs emphasize this importance of cultural sickness and richness and the role of beauty, the importance of non-productive aspects of the human life, the recognition of the richness of human lives uh, with their many nuances and complexities. 
where um, this idea of we talk about the development of the whole person um, rings through and invites us to think about development as a transformation also of cultural uh, factors. That's the third. The fourth is special consideration of the most disadvantaged and those left behind. Special consideration of the most disadvantaged and those left behind. This is sometimes called a preferential option for the poor using questions like who is uh, most at risk who are the least protected and the most privileged? Who are the most disadvantaged? Which brings us to a critical analysis of privileges, having the entire community in mind. And finally, asking first and last questions. What does really matter? What is essential? Asking those big questions, the meta questions and the why questions beyond the how. So these five lessons, I repeat, the central role of human dignity a relational understanding of development of the human person, the consideration of cultural richness, special consideration of the most disadvantaged, asking first and last questions, these five lessons could be translated into a list of necessary conditions. In order for us to be justified in using IHD, those five aspects would have to be included. And we could summarize that by IHD means the effort to respect and include each person and the whole person. IHD means the effort to respect and include each person and the whole person. I'm not yet done learning from my colleagues. Uh, my colleagues have uh, brilliant and critical minds, which is sometimes the same thing, but not always. And um, I also want to mention a few criticisms that, that uh, my colleagues brought up vis-a-vis -vis, uh, IHD. And I mentioned five. IHD is unrealistic, vague, fuzzy, authoritarian and anthropocentric. Unrealistic, vague, fuzzy, authoritarian and anthropocentric. I would like to offer a few uh, you know, comments in, in defense of IHD, understanding that this will not satisfy the critics and that's why we have this beautiful discourse, ongoing discourse. Unrealistic, um, yes. But that's part of the beauty of the term to give us a sense of direction, to be aspirational. And what I would like to do to address the unrealistic nature is talk about a minimum. Avisha Magalit, as, as many of you know, distinguishes between a just society and a decent society. Sees a just society as something that we cannot attain, even though it's important to have a sense of where we want to go. And sees a decent society as the minimum. Similarly, we could think about what's the minimum that IHD would require us to achieve, even though, yes, uh, the development of each person, the whole person may, may never be fully attainable. The vagueness, it's vague, yes. And, and here, um, I think it's part of the question, which price are we willing to pay? If we define IHD very narrowly, it becomes precise, but then we lose many people. So I think vagueness is part of the beauty of the concept. And I could think of what I could call selective precision. We could be partially precise with certain aspects of IHD. Uh, for example, what's the difference between IHD and the utilitarian approach? We could be precise about that, but we will not be able to solve this, this problem of it's a vague concept because that's, I think, how it works. The third criticism, it's fuzzy, means it does not um, stand well with academic rigor. Uh, meaning it, it may water down academic rigor because it is this soft skill, uh, fuzzy kind of concept that warms the heart but doesn't have any cash value. And this criticism is important. My response to that would be rigor is important. Um, academic research, including quantitative research, uh, is extremely important for IHD, understanding uh, those who have resources, those who have not access to resources, what are the poverty lines and levels. This is hugely important, but it cannot be the end. That's a means to an end. So um, this kind of academic research for IHD uh, is a means to an end, but will not be able to answer the first and the last questions that IHD encourages us to ask. Fourth criticism, it's authoritarian because it comes from a normative tradition that um, nobody, of course, is obliged to buy into. And my response to that would be, that is why we need to democratize the discourse on, CS, uh, on, on, on IHD and, and, and CST. We need to have more people talking about IHD, people from different backgrounds. Uh, Catholic soil teaching can benefit a lot from outsiders. Uh, the idea of an inclusive community, uh, this idea 
is, as you know, a challenge for some aspects of Catholic social teaching. So let's democratize this, this concept and the discourse. As I mentioned before, no one is the sole owner of the discourse. And finally, it's anthropocentric. And my response to that very well-founded criticism is, yes, indeed, integral human development has human in the, in the middle. Um, one way to think about integral human development in uh, response to the criticism would be uh, use the term integral ecology. Integral ecology where the social and ecological come together and where integral human development cannot be separated uh, from concerns with the environment. Laudato Si as well as Fratelli Tutti talk uh, powerfully about that. So that's uh, my second section, learning from my colleagues, uh, lessons learned and criticisms. Now, a few questions and concepts in my third section here. IHD, as I see it, uh, can serve as a source of um, questions and concepts, maybe not so much as a source of responses and theses. There is a particular way of asking questions through IHD. I give you four examples. Number one, what kind of world do we want to leave to those who come after us, to children who are now growing up? That's a quotation from Laudato C. 160. It's a very good question. What kind of world do we want to leave to those who come after us, to children who are now growing up? And this question invites us to think beyond the individual's horizon, invites us to think about our concerns and preferences in their global and long-term effects. That's an IHD question. Another IHD question would be, how can we overcome indifference? How can we overcome indifference? IHD is incompatible with what Pope Francis has called the globalization of indifference. In his most recent encyclical, Fratelli Tutti, Pope Francis mentions indifference several times. He denounces a cool, comfortable, and globalized indifference, which he also calls cruel. In this regard, Fratelli Tutti is an extension, the elaboration of Laudato Si, where he talked about the globalization of indifference and the widespread indifference to suffering and a nonchalant resignation. And um, IHD would um, invite us to think about how can we overcome indifference. And um, what you see here is um, a sculpture that Pope Francis gave to the FAO headquarters in Rome when he paid a visit to the FAO headquarters on October um, 2017. In his little speech, he said, death by starvation or the abandonment of one's own land is everyday news, which risks being met with indifference. We cannot resign ourselves to saying someone else will take care of it. During this visit to the FAO, Pope Francis donated this marble sculpture. The statue depicts the tragic death of uh, Alan Kurdi, also known as Ailan, a three-year-old Syrian boy whose body uh, was washed up on the shore of Turkey in September 2015 after a small boat holding a dozen refugees had capsized. Next to Ailan, we find a childlike angel weeping over the boy's lifeless body. Pope Francis wanted the FAO experts to be aware of the human realities. He wanted them to be aware in the midst of their work that these are human realities. It reminds me a little bit of the German historian uh, Christian Meyer who worked on Auschwitz and the historical aspects of Auschwitz. And he said, you have to use your standard historical methods. You have to be rigorous in, in um, uh, dealing with, with Auschwitz as a historical phenomenon. But again and again, once in a while, you have to stop and admit the painful realization, this really happened. This really happened. So that's an IHD question. How can we overcome indifference? A third IHD question would be, What's the situation we are in? Where are we speaking from? What is the situation we are in? We cannot afford a veil of ignorance any longer, as, as, as fruitful the idea is. We are now cursed by what could be called a wound of knowledge. We know too much about tragic developments. Um, we have lost our innocence in this regard. It was this wound of knowledge that um, triggered the uh, negotiations for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's a wound because it's painful to think about atrocities and destruction, but it's also a wound because the knowledge is tragic in the sense that we know too much and too little at the same time. We know too much uh, to be indifferent, and we know too little because we don't really know how to address those global challenges. 
In previous times, there were two standard questions to address uh, challenges. The questions were, how much does it cost and who pays? How much does it cost and who pays? Meanwhile, we have left the shores of these two questions. Just one little example, in a report in The Guardian from 2010, we read, for nearly 30 years, India and Bangladesh have argued over control of a tiny rock island in the Bay of Bengal. Now, rising sea levels have resolved the dispute for them. The island has gone. End of quote. New Moor Island. No money of the world will bring this island back. We are speaking from a situation of irreversible and urgent changes and a new sense of limits. Limits of natural resources, limits of what money can buy. So that's the situation we are speaking from, where uh, we may have to rethink um, the necessity of certain directions of development. A last question, uh, who are we to become? Who are we to become? In an article on the common good during the pandemic, Mark Hoypkemia used this language as the key question. Who are we to become? Which kind of community do we want to become? That's an IHD question. So I think IHD serves as an important source of important questions that will not go away. It also serves as a source of concepts. The key concept is human dignity. If I take human dignity as my starting point, I recognize the uniqueness of each human person and the equality of all in this uniqueness. I also recognize a sense of mystery. There is a bit of literature on the connection between the concept of uh, human dignity and the concept of mystery. The German um, uh, jurist, Christopher Müller, uh, talked about that. The sense of uh, human dignity gives us a concept that uh, has inexhaustible meaning. That's one definition of a mystery, the capacity for inexhaustible meaning. When we talk about um, human dignity, we talk about not only problems, we talk about something else. In Gabriel uh, Marcel's terminology, we talk about a mystery. And this mystery is sometimes expressed in, in, in some faith traditions in a creation story. And um, the idea of being created in the image and likeness of God is, as Jeremy Walton once put it, too precious to be left to religious people alone. So it should be part of the discourse on human dignity, not that everybody has to believe that, but people have to realize it's such a precious thought. It's so close to mystery that people have uh, used this kind of imagery to talk about human dignity. With human dignity comes an idea of respect and self-respect. If you, if you um, respect the dignity in the other person, you're obliged to a certain sense of integrity. If you respect dignity in yourself, you're also obliged to some kind of self-respect and integrity, where then development becomes something like enabling people to live lives of integrity. Um, I'm working on institutional ethics where this is the key point. These institutions allow people to live lives um, with their integrity, with respect and self-respect. I have to skip this and I come to my section four. I'm at 26 minutes in my talk. I will end at 35. Section four is incompatibilities. So what, what have I covered so far? I talked about the language game as uh, source sensitive and non-authoritarian. I talked about lessons learned from my esteemed colleagues, uh, those five important lessons, the central role of human dignity, a relational understanding of development of the human person, the consideration of cultural richness, special consideration of the most disadvantaged and asking first and last questions. I mentioned some of the critical points uh, raised in the Kiyo School, and I briefly talked about important questions and some key concepts that um, IHD would invite us to reflect on. Section four, incompatibilities. One way to get a little more precise with the concept of IHD is to think about what is it not compatible with. Um, if IHD were compatible with each approach, and every approach, this would not be helpful for the understanding of the term. I would suggest four identity conferring and identity rooting incompatibilities. And I'm not saying that an approach that's incompatible with IHD is bad or wrong. I'm not saying that. That's not the claim I'm making. I'm just saying if you, if you uh, accept IHD as your main commitment, uh, you cannot uh, sail on the other ships as well. So four identity conferring and identity rooted incompatibilities, which would be, by the way, a second source for necessary conditions for HD. The first is a neutral understanding of development. 
IHD is a normative concept. It is not compatible with a sense of there is a neutral uh, ground on which we can talk about um, development. If you have a commitment to human dignity at the center, uh, there is a normative dimension that does not go away. And I would also think that IHD um, necessarily leads to discussion of overdevelopment, not only underdevelopment, but also overdevelopment, a question of the ceiling and not just of the floor. Secondly, IHD is incompatible with a one-dimensional understanding of the human condition, be it materialist or be it spiritualist. The person does not live by bread alone, but the person does need bread. And one-dimensional uh, conceptions of development of the human person, the human condition, are incompatible with IHD. Thirdly, selective approaches that focus on majorities. Utilitarianism comes to mind. Effective uh, altruism is a, is a beautiful idea. It's very persuasive. It's very powerful. But it is not compatible with IHD. The idea of, of serving the majority and not trying to protect the most vulnerable. This idea is not compatible with IHD. Um, the, the Lieutenant Governor of Texas, Dan Patrick, suggested about a year ago that the elderly should sacrifice themselves for the sake of the economy. This is not an IHD compatible idea, even though it's persuasive, it makes sense, you can produce arguments. And that also says something about the limits of arguments when we talk about IHD and this sense of mystery of the human person. Fourthly, IHD is incompatible with what Pope Francis called the technocratic paradigm. The idea of we can fix this, this we can fix this attitude. It comes from a tradition where you cannot have a reform without a reform of the hearts. So each dimension of the person being um, involved. I remember a powerful presentation by MGA students on, on uh, Chinese investments in Africa. And they gave a great presentation on what could be done to protect Africa's uh, or the African country's interests. And then Father Paulinus asked this question, what about the corruption problem? What about the corruption problem? And this is a much deeper seated challenge than, than you know, fixing little things. I just listened to a talk by John Paul Lederach, a talk he gave in, in the summer of, of last year, where he said, we have a tendency to externalize responses to deep human suffering. How do we skill our way out of this, as opposed to how do we hone the presence necessary to stay with it? We need to insist on our persistence and move away from the quick fix. We also need to be clear that patience and persistence puts us in a space of constant mystery rather than in a place where we have answers for others. End of quote. So technocratic paradigm, quick fix, incompatible with IHD. This would give us four necessary conditions, additional necessary conditions, no neutral understanding of development, no one dimensional understanding of the human condition, no selective approach that focuses on majorities and no technocratic paradigm. Which gives me four minutes and my last section five, which I call dignity practices. Doing dignity is like watering a plant so that it doesn't wither. The um, Integrated Human Development Research Lab that uh, Father Emanuel Katongul and I are working on um, is, is working in, in four fields. One, conceptual work, the semantic clarification of IHD, and we have invested quite a bit in that. Secondly, the moral biographies of projects. We want to see the presence and power of uh, moral challenges and the commitment to human dignity in development projects. And this is where the IHD lab has not made much progress because of the pandemic. The third is identifying dignity practices. Identifying practices that show a commitment to the effort of practicing human dignity, even if it's difficult and costly, which I call the deep practice of human dignity. Um, and finally, uh, the case study uh, is our flagship project, Father Emanuel Katongles Bethany Land Institute, which is uh, an IHD lab in practice, so to speak, because he builds this agricultural training institute on the basis of his understanding of IHD in conversation with Pope Francis Laudato Si. I just mentioned dignity practices. The hospice movement and palliative care facilities in African countries are good examples of, of dignity practices. I just finished a research project where we had uh, 20 interviews with custodians and cleaning uh, personnel in Germany and Austria, looking at the, um, um, the ethics of institutions from below, uh, bringing those um, um, into the discourse that are normally not uh, considered. 
And um, we also look into uh, the possibility of defining a minimum for IHD, which would be avoiding humiliation and cruelty. Avoiding humiliation and cruelty as the minimum uh, of uh, respecting the dignity of the human person. And you could say one way to operationalize IHD would be to look at this minimum. Where are entry points for humiliation? Where are entry points and incidents of cruelty? And you can even map institutions by, by looking at those entry points for humiliation. We just completed uh, two of those exercises, mapping entry points for humiliation in the hospital in England, in the NHS, in the hospital in Austria, where it is possible to, to think about human dignity as something that can be uh, operationalized through a minimum that defines it negatively as the absence of humiliation. So that was my talk. And I have a concluding remark and one minute, 15 seconds left. And my concluding remark is this. One book I want to write before I die could be called Development as Steps. Development as Steps. I mentioned the wound of knowledge. This wound of knowledge does not condone cheerful recklessness. Cheerful recklessness or in Pope Francis' words, it is time to acknowledge that lighthearted superficiality has done us no good. I like to distinguish between a living standard, the quality of life, and the depths of life. And um, IHD may be the invitation to think about the readiness to lower one's quality of life because of one's steps of life. Children taking care of their elderly parents, parents taking care of their children, may not be conducive to their quality of life, but it expresses a commitment that brings the depth and the weight to life that makes life worthwhile living. I think this is one of those first and last questions that IHD as a concept and as a process invites us to ask. Thank you very much for attention. I look forward to benevolent questions and comments and footnotes. Thank you so much, Clemens. Uh, that was um, not only 35 precise minutes, but 35 very rich and substantial minutes with a lot to talk about and think about. So, um, so that, that's terrific. Um, so if people want, anyone who wants to ask a question, feel free to raise your virtual hand and I can keep the queue here. Uh, again, as I said at the beginning, but for those of you who are late, if you prefer for whatever reason, simply to type a question into the chat, I'll try to keep uh, track of that um, as well. Um, and question, Clemens, while, while people are starting to write out their questions and, and joining the queue, and there already is someone, but I'll, I'd like to get things started just with one question. I wanna go back to um, the objection that you responded to regarding anthropocentrism. And you made an appeal to perhaps, you know, connecting IHD to integral ecology as a way of addressing that or, or yeah. mitigating that. But I, I'd like to, I guess, resist that a little bit, not resist the connection to human ecology, but integral ecology, but resist the suggestion that moving towards integral ecology makes it less anthropocentric. Um, yeah, my, understanding, yeah, yeah, yeah. my understanding of integral ecology is it still keeps the human person at the center of things. Yes. Now it does, of course, connect the human person in a very substantial way to all of the created order and to certain responsibility for other things. And so in that sense, it is, you know, it isn't, it isn't a, um, an anthropocentrism that is exclusive mm. or uh, oppositional to the rest of creation, but it is still uh, the human person at the center. So this leads to the, the actual question. I mean, why not say simply, yes, it is anthropocentric. And in fact, that should belong in one of the other categories of things you talked about, about identity rooting aspects of the idea and say, look, that's another, as you to use your analogy, that's another ship that's sailing. If you're if you're not willing to take seriously that there is something distinctive about the dignity of human persons within the creative order, then this ship isn't for you. Is that right? You know, as I said, you, you caught me there. Uh, the, the, the criticism actually was voiced in, in terms of it's anthropocentric. It does not consider the environment and it has to be much more ecologically sensitive. And so my response to this um, uh, version of the anthropocentrism uh, criticism would be, well, it, it could be and should be connected to integral ecology where uh, living a life in integrity today uh, cannot... Um, 
abstain from taking those ecological factors where we have a stewardship responsibility into account. But yes, the, the very fact it's called integral human development <laughs> makes it by definition anthropocentric. I mean, it's even the middle term, right? Integral human development makes it, makes it uh, anthropocentric. And um, I think uh, this may even be part of the, um, the cash value of the concept that it connects um, a commitment to um, human dignity vis-a-vis -vis others with, with um, a commitment to responsibility. So, so everybody knows Amatya Sen's wonderful book, Development is Freedom. And IHD leans more towards development as responsibility. Again, I'm not saying that this is completely incompatible. I, I like to talk about comfort zones. Um, capability approach and CSD and IHD live in different comfort zones, but the emphasis is slightly different. And uh, I, I'm totally with you if you're honest, and, and sometimes it, it's good to be honest, right? Uh, if you're honest, IHD is an anthropocentric concept, comes from an anthropocentric tradition that places the human person in the creation hierarchy at the, at the very top. Even though I always like to remind us, if we take the account in the book of Genesis of the creation, uh, chapter one, um, <laughs> On the sixth day, God created the creatures of the land and the human person. It did not take God a full day to create a full a human person. You know, it wasn't that hard of a job. And, and that also should give us a sense of uh, we, are, we are closer uh, to, to the other non-human uh, creatures than, than, than we might think we are. But um, in the sense of, um, yes, incompatibility, putting my cards on the table, I don't think that you can um, commit to IHD without distorting its meaning too much, without being anthropocentric. And having maybe a benevolent understanding of the term. Yeah. Thank you. Just one, one little footnote comment on that. I um, I loved also uh, your repeated references to the centrality of the first and last questions. And that seems to me indirectly another confirmation of the human person at the center of uh, of what IHD is about. Because, right, because that, I mean, it, it is a human being that is asking the first and last questions necessarily, right? Um, all right, let, let me uh, turn now to our colleague Amitabha Dutt, who has uh, a question for you. Amitabha, go ahead. Yeah, hi, Clemens. Um, hi, Amitabha. Very, very interesting talk. I, I enjoyed it very much. Uh, the, the, what are you, what are you trying to do? But let me just ask you um, two, two questions about your talk. One is that development, uh, I don't know what it means, but I think it means improvement in some sense and improvement in a, in a holistic sense. And one thing we can do, at least many of us who have enough resources to live in a decent way is to improve ourselves and to develop ourselves. Uh, yet I find uh, a lot of people, in fact, most people making no effort to, to even be self-critical. Uh, and uh, including myself, I, 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 I try to do that, but I don't know how successful I am. And the and you you don't talk about that very much. You talk about uh, integral human development without personal responsibility for one's own development very much, uh, or perhaps I missed it. Uh, related to this is the whole question of of a lot of people in the world are not in a position to to do this and. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned uh, the idea of preferential option for the poor, whatever you call it. Uh, now, these, these things are often connected with societies, institutions, and power relations. And just by improving yourself, you cannot change these structures. And I see, in other words, both an uh, absence of let's call it psychology, but also uh, politics and, and society as a whole. Um, by 
uh, by focusing on integral human dignity. And and on this point, let me just 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 say that I really, really oppose both your ideas about human development. It's a very, very Western and Christian concept, which is not shared by many, many others. The main virtue of not making human centric is to actually get out of selfishness and 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 uh, tribalism. Mm. Humans mm. are a tribe. And just to focus on humans is, I think, just as bad as, uh, as, as say, uh, you know, othering the other. Anyway. All right. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Amitabha. Uh, so there's three points. Your first point, self-improvement and, and being self-critical. I, I had this little footnote about self-respect. Human dignity comes with uh, obligations towards oneself if you recognize your own dignity, which is sometimes called self-respect. And this may bring us to the point, uh, Dworkin and other talk about that, that we have an obligation to make something out of our lives, which I think could be argued on the basis of IHD with a, with a human dignity focus. Um, the second, um, the power relations and many people not having the chance to live decent lives and this for structural reasons. I think that's one of the biggest wounds of, of poverty that people are not in a position to live lives um, according to well-justified standards of integrity. Uh, parents do want to be able to feed their children. And if, they, if the uh, circumstances do not allow that, I mean, they are deprived of this possibility of, of living to well-justified standards of, of integrity. And that's, I think, the structural um, considerations and even, even dignity-focused policies could come in with the question, how can you make the lives of the most um, disadvantaged and the least privileged um, more decent? With, with the minimum standards that I mentioned. The third point, you know, it's so, what's the word I'm looking for? Refreshing to have strong opposition to anthropocentrism. Um, the only thing I can, I can offer to you is um, a mitigated version of anthropocentrism, not understood as we focus on humans alone, but we see the stewardship responsibility. Um, but it's, it's really, as, as Paolo said before, if we accept the concept we have to accept that it has an anthropocentric um, dimension that will not go away, which is maybe uh, one other way to say this is um, a, a good um, way to reflect on the limits of IHD, on, 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 on the question of where is IHD uh, not convincing and persuasive given, given a global standard rather than a Christian uh, or a Western standard. So in this sense, uh, I think, as I said, we need to democratize the discourse on IHD. But in all intellectual honesty, um, if I commit to IHD, I'm committed to anthropocentrism, or I would have to call it differently. Great. Thank you, uh, Amitava and, uh, and Clemens. Uh, Nitesh Chawla, please. Hi, Clemens. How are you? I, I, I enjoyed your, your yes, talk you. uh, and, your, and your discussion. So I, I actually would like to sort of think a bit more about the anthropocentric okay. aspect of things that, and that, that integral human development being actually a much more relative concept than in absolutism, right? So, and when we look at just look uh, from, a, because if you think about, and as a data-driven scholar, as we're trying to collect the data, the human narrative, the human narrative paints a picture of the circumstances, the societal elements, and, and the context that human is operating in. And at some point, that context overwhelms that what the virtues of self-development in many ways, right? When you, when you said being that self-consciousness and things like that, especially in uh, in the throes of poverty, for example, right? When one is trying to think about the other familial aspects. So, so how do we now then begin to go beyond the idea of, uh, sorry, my dog's barking, uh, anthropocentric uh, collection of data, which is focusing on very much the self and while also incorporating the sense of community society that influences the human development. Because one, I don't think one can divorce the two. You know, Nitesh, I'm not sure I have a good uh, answer to your question. I can say something about the context and the, the, uh, your point about IHD being more relative than absolute as a concept. It's, it's, it's uh, clearly contextual since human dignity in its uh, enactment is, is contextual. 
Uh, one, one of my hobbies, as some people know, is uh, looking at the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights, especially when they talk about the Article 3 violations, uh, that's the, the paragraph on, on degrading and inhuman treatment. And then they have to decide, the judges have to decide, was the dignity of the person involved violated, yes or no? And, and they need to um, um, consider contextual factors. And they need to have a sick description understanding of the situation to be able to judge that. I think the same is, is the case for an understanding of IHD. Um, one of the concerns we always get is, is it measurable? Can you measure IHD? And I think what, what people mean by that is, do we recognize it when we see it? And, and there are obviously uh, limits to what data can do. Um, you are the data person. I, I can only offer this idea of um, the why question and the so what question would come into play once you have a data collection. Why would you be interested in those kinds of data in the first place? And what do we do with those, with those data once we have um, those data collected in the second place? And um, that's where I see IHD as, as being, in a sense, neutral uh, to the, the research method, as long as it is you know, uh, not violating any moral standards, uh, using academic standards of rigor. Uh, and that's nothing special about IHD. But the special thing about IHD may be, why are we interested in those kinds of data and what do we do with those data once we have processed the, the, the big data collection, which is not very helpful for you. But Nitesh, if you could help us, Ma Maura Policelli has this wonderful idea of developing a dignity index as a key school product. And this cannot happen without big data. So maybe we can collaborate on that, that we can you know, use the best of scientific methods to bring dignity as a seemingly soft concept into, into policy making. Great. Um, so um, we have a question from Fritz Heinzen. Yep. Fritz, thank you for joining us. Well, I enjoyed I enjoyed the talk, and and the, there is so much that comes from this. I have a couple of pages of notes, so I'll just try to uh, pick on possibly two two things. Um, and and the first one is this: is that you you've brought forth so many interesting ideas that that when we leave here at at one forty five or whatever, I'm trying to figure out where where one goes next with with this. And so what are you doing? Are you putting together a paper, book, et cetera, that type of a thing? Because um, to, to make what we've learned today useful, I, I can show students two pages of notes, but I, I'm thinking a little more practically in that there's, um, for example, I'll be talking in the next few days to some students in, uh, at a university um, that has a course on food security. And, and, I, and I guess I can think of, or well, I, I I approach these students, most of them Christian, and in, in two ways. And I would say there's the, as you pursue something like this, you have spiritual readings, these kinds of things, which would in, reinforce what, what you're trying to get across here. And, and for me, that would be the Gospels, uh, maybe Gary Anderson's book on charity, which I think is a, is a wonderful look at that. And, but, but then what is sort of a, a practical set? Have you Put together a practical set of readings or, or things to, to to move forward. Um, you know, this is all very interesting what you've set forward, but what next? Where next? How do you move forward, uh, whether in the classroom or whether with think tanks uh, or people on the field uh, uh, um, working in development projects? Well, and then the second you... question, oh, sorry. If, there's, if there's, I do have a second one, totally divorced from this one. If others don't have questions, it's going to be a little uh, tougher question. This is, I think, a softball question. I think I've got a tougher, tougher one. If nobody else has questions, okay. I, I'd lo Thank love you. to come back to the tougher one too, Fred. So stay, stay tuned, uh, you. Clemens. Before you, before you take the softball one, uh, let me say a, a word um, uh, to um, of, of introduction or background, perhaps um, more than I said at the beginning. But I did uh, introduce Clemens, those of you who are here at the very start of the talk, um, by referring to the policy and practice lab that we've started at the proposal on the proposal of Clemens and Emmanuel Katongole. And um, this lab is, is part of a series of policy and practice labs that the Kellogg Institute has established over the last year. I think we have five of them now in different areas. And uh, the goal in general of this whole initiative within the Institute is to um, 
uh, invest sort of resources and attention in generating research that has a much more immediately uh, actionable character within the spheres of policy and practice. And so it really is, you know, the goal of this initiative that Clemens and Emmanuel are leading uh, to do exactly what you're asking for, Fritz, right? To, to, you know, to develop concrete ways in which this can be actionable, that it can cash out, to use a phrase Clemens was using, in, from the classroom to in, in the field. So, you know, Clemens, you touched on this. Um, I mean, uh, what I think would be your answers to this in the last part of your talk when you, um, you know, talked about dignity practices, but also some of the specific proposals of the lab, what the lab is, is ex proposing to do. But um, you packed so much into the talk that, you know, that you weren't able to elaborate much on that. So um, however else you wanna answer it, could you also say just a little bit more about the specific kinds of activities and projects that the lab is going to be engaged in as you envision it so far? Thank you, Paolo, and then thank you, Fritz. Um, so one, one way to talk, uh, to, to answer your question is, uh, I teach the Integral Human Development Foundation seminar for our master students here at the Q School. Um, wonderful, wonderful people um, who like to make the world a better place. As Amitava said, improve, improve something, including improve, improve um, our own personalities. And we carefully pick the readings for that. And, and for, for the last session we had, uh, I think I mentioned that the 20 minutes uh, video with John Paul Lederach, the talk he gave in, in June, um, which is, John Paul Lederach is such an um, inspiring person. He does not use IHD as a concept, but he very much engages in what I would call an IHD practice or a dignity practice. Um, we also work with poems. Um, for example, I give you one concrete example because we have a little bit of time. Um, Eduardo Galliano has this wonderful poem, Nosotros, um, which, which in the Spanish is uh, Tenemos la alegría de nuestras alegrías y también tenemos la alegría de nuestros dolores, porque no nos interesa la vida indolora que la civilización del consumo vende en los supermercados y estamos orgullosos del precio de tanto dolor que por tanto amor pagamos which means something like we have the joy of our joys, we have the choice of our pains. We find little interest in the painless life that supermarkets package and sell, and we take pride in the price of so much pain that with such love we pay. And these are powerful readings. And, and then of course, um, what, what do we do with that? I like to tell my students, uh, and I remind myself, uh, I would want to make it as difficult as possible for all of us to turn into soulless bureaucrats who forget that we are talking about real human lives and, 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 and realities. What I mentioned with Christian Meyer, you know, talking about Auschwitz, this really happened. It, it's not just a historical phenomenon out there. We also create uh, an online IHD handbook as part of the IHD Research Lab. On the, on the website of the IHD Research Lab, you find at this point five entries for this handbook that talk about um, concrete Literature, yes, but also concrete experiences and examples of IHD relevant projects and professional experiences of, of persons. And these uh, texts are written by students. So one, one assignment in the class is to, to write one entry for this IHD handbook, which I hope uh, will be used as a teaching source. The blog that I mentioned uh, is, is also a teaching source that I love to use. My colleagues, I mean, have really wonderful ideas, very strong, powerful messages, and I like to work with that. And as Paolo said, the lab is designed to, to change some little things on the ground. So, so Father Manuel Katongole bought a huge piece of land in Uganda um, nine years ago. And now he's developing an agricultural training institute called the Bethany Land Institute, which you can easily find in, in, in the web, BLI, Bethany Land Institute, where he wants to show how IHD can inform this project from the very beginning from the planning stage, from the curriculum, from the way they deal with um, the forests, or the, the, the forestry um, and, and, and um, the cattle herding. So it's, it's uh, IHD in, in practice. And what we did not do so far is the moral biographies of projects, looking at development projects through a moral lens. And the idea here is quite simple. There are biographies of human beings and you can even write a moral biography of a person uh, and you could do the same, looking at the history of a development project, uh, what were reasons and causes to bring this about, and what were moral, uh, moral challenges that people faced and how did they deal with that. 
and and this would give us a collection of very concrete analysis that would show how an IHD perspective can make a difference on the ground. And, and lastly, as I mentioned, this this uh, mapping uh, exercise for institutions. That that's a, a quite concrete and simple tool. Identify entry points for humiliation in an institutional setting. And then I can I can give you just three examples from the hospital study that we did. Asking patients where do they feel that entry points of humiliation where their human dignity is at risk um, have been institutionalized. And they mention uh, bodily shame, you know, nakedness. They mention lack of privacy. And they mention instrumentalization during the doctor's rounds where the person is reduced to the part of the body that's, that's aching or, or problematic. And this is subjective, but it has to be taken seriously as an entry point that you can systematically map those entry points. And that's one of the projects, that's, uh, projects that the IHD Research Lab is, is doing. Of course, Fadi Amman is not with us today because he is um, in Uganda as we speak, working on the BLI. Um, and he has many connections into the dicastery for promoting integral human development. And, and um, I think will influence some global engagements by the Catholic Church on this level through those connections. Fantastic. Thank you, Clemens. So we're at 1.30. I'm sure many people um, will need to drop off at the hour, um, and a few already have, but there's still a substantial number here. And I, I suggest that we go just a few more minutes and take, there are two more questions of people with their hands up, and I have one question in the chat as well. Um, why don't we, um, Clemens, have uh, all three of the questions posed at once, because you might have you know, uh, ways of, of answering them uh, in ways that are overlapping uh, rather than take one uh, at, at a time and perhaps run out of time. So let me start with the one that I have in the chat, which is essentially, um, you know, if we're asking about um, what uh, sort of the, what uh, gives birth to the dynamism of a person's integral human development, um, the question is, says, you know, uh, especially given what you said about the social dimension of human dignity and IHD, um, where does education uh, fit into this? I mean, how, how does education become a critical factor in starting uh, um, the process of integral human development mm -hmm. within a person and within a community? Um, and then in addition to that, we have questions from, let's go to Tom Mustillo next, and then to um, to Jan Banas. Go ahead, Tom. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Clemens. That was really great um, and enriching. Um, I wanted to ask a question, uh, you know, and we've kind of talked about it on the side, you and me, a, a couple of times. Um, and you, you cast it here in terms of methods. Um, I, I, I guess I wonder, there seems to be within the concept at least the way we've articulated it around the Keo School, in a discomfort with kind of non-proximate ways of, encount of, en of encountering the world, the human being. Um, and, and of course, you know, we as an institution of higher education, um, we're, we're, we're trying to pursue knowledge, right? So how we approach, how we approach um, the human being in the world is as important. So, is that true? Is, is there, you know, you kind of gave a dodge a moment ago um, by saying it occupies this kind of, it's a means to an end. It's sort of method is the middle, it's method neutral. But I guess I wanna ask like, if, if within these necessary inclusion or excluded um, kind of incompatibilities, really there, there's more like the knowing how we know coming to know, um, you know, we're, the natural order, the created order of the human being is super important and central and, um, and not neutral. Like a moment ago, you said that like a one dimensional conceptualization of the, of the human being would be an incompatibility. I would say an N, you know, an N dimensional understanding, if we're satisfied with even a very broad but limited finite um, way of knowing or understanding the human being, the natural order, it, it's, it's incompatible because there are so many ways of knowing. And so it's not about experimental or data or, or, um, or, or I don't know, ethnography. It's really more a matter of, it's not a matter of method. It's a matter of, um, 
um, um, knowledge, not coming to know, you know, what we, what we, what we know about this, this world. And of course, if you're, if you're a person of faith about, about, uh, about God. So um, I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Jan, please feel free to add your question too, and then we'll give Clemens a, a, a final chance to wrap up. Thank you very much. Um, I, I enjoyed the talk very much, and I have one question, if you could maybe elaborate, I know uh, we don't have much time, on the, on the criticism that the, the I, IHD concept uh, is, is unrealistic, because it seems to me that uh, it's, it's a question to the, uh, a, 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 an answer to the, to the very general question, how to best organize our society, and, and when we want to assess the, the answers to this question, I think we need to, to make two types of considerations. One are uh, desirability consideration of the, of the answer, of the particular an answer, and then there's feasibility considerations. And um, I, think, I think the desirability considerations uh, uh, need, to be, need to be done first. And, and it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't mean that the feasibility uh, is not important, but even if an answer is uh, unrealistic or unfeasible, and if, and if it is at the same time still desirable, then, then it can very well serve as a kind of a regulative ideal. So I, I think if, if, if you could uh, elaborate on the, on the criticism, because prima facie, it's, it's not too damning for me. I mean, thank you. Thank you. Can I go ahead and follow? So thank you, um, anonymous friend, Tom and Jan, for the questions. The first was about where does education fit into this a person's uh, IHD? Um, and for, for me, this seems to be so um, practical that, that uh, education means um, as a teacher, you follow your vocation. You try to make the classroom as participatory and inclusive as possible. That learning is not something you pour into the students, but that the classroom is, to use this language, co-owned. Um, in Notre Dame, we have uh, many uh, overachievers, uh, um, competitive students. And I like to encourage us to rethink our climate in terms of what's the, the contribution that only you can make. So, so in, in ethics, uh, there is the categorical imperative, which is beautiful and important. Uh, but there's also this question, what is it that remains undone if you don't do that? What's the niche that you inhabit, given your uniqueness as a person? And that's why I would always try to um, include individual pathways to the grade, that students who know their strengths can choose between, I don't know, a video they do, a presentation they do, an essay they write, an all midterm exam, um, just to honor this sense of the uniqueness of the person. And one colleague uh, in, in our, I think that's now already two years ago, one and a half years ago, um, discussed from IHD in the Kiosk school, asked this question, what difference should it make in the classroom? I mean, for our day-to-day -day teaching. And I think you can try to minimize entry points of humiliation in the classroom. You can try to make sure the students feel respected and recognized in their uniqueness. So that's, I think, where education comes in. And education understood as a sense of, um, you develop, uh, respect for yourself, respect for your life and respect for others and the contents you, you deal with, then there's a very natural segue, you know, from educational efforts to integrate human development that happens without people noticing it. Tom's question or, or, or point, um, you know, you know, Tom, the, the, the question seems to be so simple, but it's, it's, it's as you mentioned, it's, it's so much deeper than just saying, look, any method counts as long as it, as it doesn't claim to have the last word. That's too cheap an answer. I realized that. I mean, it was my initial answer uh, that, that randomized control trials, that quantitative research, big data, you know, um, is, is clearly an important uh, tool for something that can be used in any way, including an IHD way. But it, it, seems, it seems to be uh, not as value-driven as uh, other aspects of IHD. 
Now you come back and say, look, it is value driven. There are different ways of knowledge and the epistemology is, is an important aspect to that. And there are many different ways of knowing. And I think what IHD could offer here is a meta level, a meta level where we talk about things like epistemic justice, where we talk about things like reducing someone to an epistemic object, uh, talk about the, the uh, pluralism of, of methods without uh, supremacy um, questions or because sometimes we, we talked about that in a seminar. We uh, present methods as if there was uh, a methodological competitive pluralism so that one excludes the other. And, and I would like to go beyond that, but, but um, that's a meta question. I think IHD cannot help us with the methods per se, but with those meta questions, how do they relate? And for me, uh, more and more emerges that humility is such a key virtue when it comes to IHD. The humility of the expert, the humility of the, the researcher, the humility of the teacher, the humility of all of us who are involved in IHD efforts, um, where, well, knowing our limits, I think, uh, which, which is part maybe of the education bit, self-knowledge, maybe a key thing, understanding the limits of what we do. And that's why, I, as you know, I... I I did not invent the term IHD. I did not create the Kiosk school and say, let's do IHD. So I, I try my best to, 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 to use IHD as a, a source of inspiration. Um, but I see the limits of IHD clearly. And, and uh, that goes maybe uh, to, to Jan's point about the, the feasibility versus desirability distinction. Um, even non-feasible definitions, as you said, uh, have a value as regulative ideas. So the WHO, the WHO definition of health, you know, this perfect state of well-being on these levels is, is completely unfeasible. But it, it gives us even a policy sense of orientation. This is where we have to, to move towards. The same with the idea of justice and the same with the idea of leave no one behind and try to consider uh, the whole person in all her dimensions. As, as Tom said, not even N dimensions, I mean, beyond any finite uh, dimensionality of, of the person. I mean, the criticism was this, we are a policy school and, and we are encouraged to translate insights into real transformations on the ground. Policy papers and policies that change people's lives. And when you have a too lofty concept, people will say, well, what's, what's the difference the concept can make on the ground? And that's the, the working question of the IHD Research Lab. What difference does IHD make on the ground and in concrete circumstances? Um, and that's where the, the question came from. So not, not, it's, it's, it's not a beautiful uh, regulative idea like justice and, and perfection, you know, all these beautiful, sainthood, I mean, all these beautiful terms. Um, it was a little more severe than that. Why would we choose as a policy school to have, to, to have this kind of defining slogan? And that's where we have to do some translation work. And I think uh, the, the more we can show, um, and it's easy on the micro level. If, if I talk about a concrete hospital, it's comparatively easy to show how IHD can make a difference. If I look at one concrete project like uh, Immanuel Kadongole's Bethany Land Institute, it's comparatively easy to show how it can make a difference. But on the macro level, it gets trickier. You know, if you have a, a country level, Nigeria tries to do an anti-poverty policy um, program, uh, it, it gets much trickier. And here we need uh, Tom and all those experts on quantitative um, data. How can, what's the, what's the, 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 um, uh, the point of departure? And how, how can we measure that we move people beyond a poverty line, which uh, gives us a minimal understanding of a decent life? And that's where the feasibility question, I think, is something that will not go away easily and will be part of what we try to do as an IHD research lab, for which I thank the Kellogg Institute and its director, Paolo. Well, thank you, Clemens. This has been fantastic. Uh, I'm, and I'm so glad that we got such a good turnout today so that people could all be provoked and stimulated by these many things. And I'm sure it's going to generate a lot more conversation, um, especially because of, uh, as you concluded, because what you say that we, we are, those of us in the Keogh School, in a context where, for institutional reasons, we uh, we need to keep reflecting on this and how it, it shapes the way that we teach, the way that we research, and the way that we try to shape the world around us. Um, so in all of those areas, um, you've, you've given us so much to uh, think about and to act upon, uh, since this is a question of enacting in the end uh, a, way of, a way of being that, um, that we're seeking. So um, again, thank you very much, Clemens. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. 
Um, and I hope to see you at our next Kellogg Institute event very soon.